Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's okay on this sunny, this sunny morning. Um, welcome to our next Open High Streets webinar. Um, I'm Bev Gormley, and I'm the Heritage Trust Network's Programme Manager. And we've got a great panel lined up for you this morning, um, headed by Kate Dixon, who I'll pass over to in just a second. I just wanted to say a few words about the Heritage Trust Network, just in case you haven't come across us before. Um, there are quite a few people I noticed on the attendee list that aren't members of ours, which is fantastic. Um, so I just wanted to say a little bit about uh, the network. HTN, Heritage Trust Network, is the UK's umbrella body for heritage professionals, um, groups, organisations and general enthusiasts who are trying to rescue and restore and care for um, heritage buildings or heritage sites. Um, we've got over 300 members at the moment and we're growing, which is great. And we're really big on peer-to-peer -peer networking. I'm sure the panelists today will mention this. Um, if there's a problem that you've got with your project or you need some advice, or if you want to share your story, we've got lots of members that we can put in touch with. Um, if we can't give you the advice, then we know someone who would be able to. So it's really great if you can get involved. Um, one of our member benefits is our toolkit, which is online and it's jam packed with advice, case studies, how to guides, videos, you name it, it's on there. Um, and we've got a, a fantastic conference coming up um, later this month on the 20th. Um, and there's a week of events running up to that conference just to build up to it. So please do check it out on our events page, which is there at the bottom of the screen. And we've also got an upcoming online community um, that will be there for members to network much easier and for event attendees to network easier too. So please do check it out in the coming weeks. So just a little bit of housekeeping before I pass over to Kate. I can assure you all attendees are muted, your webcams are all off, so it doesn't matter if you're still in your pyjamas. Um, it doesn't matter if the, the cat's walking across your laptop, it's fine. Uh, there'll be a question and answer session at the end. So if you could use the padlets, the, the, the links there below um, to, to add your questions to, that would be fantastic. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website next week. And you'll be happy to know that you get an attendance certificate too. Um, that will come out about an hour after the webinar finishes along with a link to a feedback form. If you could please fill in that feedback form, it would be fantastic as all the feedback is used um, to improve our events and also to report back to our funders, which as you know, is really important. So I won't make you wait any longer. I will pass over to Kate Dixon. Welcome, Kate. Hello everyone. Apologies for making a little surprise appearance earlier when I didn't follow Bev's meticulous instructions. Apologies, Bev, there. Um, yes, you've got my picture and you can see me, I think, in the flesh. I am a trustee of the Architectural Heritage Fund. Um, I'm now the director of a heritage consultancy, Creative Heritage Consultants, based in Buxton, Derbyshire, which helps all sorts of organisations, public, private and voluntary sector organisations to, to look after um, heritage assets. Um, but I do come from a building preservation trust stable, if you like. I ran Heritage Works Building Preservation Trust for over, over a decade. Um, and I'm still a member of the Heritage Trust Network Committee for the Midlands. Um, in terms of high streets, over the years I've been involved in a lot of Townscape Heritage projects. Um, and currently, Creative Heritage is supporting for Tildesley, the community interest company that's running the Heritage High Street has um, in, in Wigan in uh, West Manchester. Um, last week, if you were on last week's webinar, you might have heard Jess Steele talking about Hastings Land Trust. Um, Hastings and Tildesley are the only two high street hazards, heritage high street hazards that are being run by voluntary sector organisations. Um, so really pleased to be supporting the, the volunteers in, in Wigan um, with their project. Um, 
we've got a great team today. You're not going to be hearing much more from me. We've got uh, Jonathan Hale, who knows all about community interest companies. Jonathan's going to give us a quick wave. He is the project manager for um, the Loughborough Generator Community Interest Companies project. And then we have Vicky, Vicky Hartum, who is the chair of Great Grimsby Ice Factory Trust, who's going to be talking about the Caspar. And we have Marie Kirbyshaw, who is the chief executive of the Cultural Culture Trust in Luton, and she's going to be talking to us about the Hat District. And Marie might switch on her camera and wave. And, uh, and <laughs> that's very nice. Thank you. So, um, right, having mastered the technology, guys, I'm going to ask you all, other than Jonathan, I think, to, to switch off. And Jonathan's going to give us just a couple of minutes on the Loughborough Generator project. Thank you, Kate. So, good, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I want to talk just for a few minutes about the, the, the generator project uh, in Loughborough. Um, if we could have the next slide, Beth. Um, this is the building that we're um, look, looking at. Um, it's a 1930s building in, in Loughborough Town Centre. Um, you can see from the, uh, the black and white uh, picture next to the colour picture that, that it's hardly changed at all. Um, since it was built in the 1930s. Um, there are two main parts to it. There's the four-storey block, um, and then there, just behind it, which you can see in the bottom right um, photograph, is an almost sort of three-storey clear height uh, gallery. Um, so there's two distinct parts to the building. Um, and I hope you can see on the ordnance survey extract um, that the, uh, the building, which is shown red there, is, is a very important entrance to the town centre. Um, the road coming in just below the north point is the main route in from Loughborough University, and the big building at the top there is Dainsbury's. Um, and the road uh, just to the north of our building is the Market Street, one of the, one of the key sort of shopping streets in, in Loughborough town centre. Uh, next slide, please, Brad. Yeah, the heritage, um, it, it, it starts with a, with a remarkable man locally, uh, uh, Herbert Schofield, who was the principal of um, Loughborough Technical Institute for nearly 40 years. Um, and he was very much a believer that further education should benefit the, the local economy. Um, so this building, uh, the generator building, is uh, um, where the Loughborough Technical Institute started, really, and Schofield built up uh, tremendous links with local uh, industries um, and you can see in the black and white pictures there it was a home of uh, uh, motor vehicle engineering, uh, textiles, um, carpentry and, and uh, woodwork and it, it trained um, thousands of, of local uh, people and uh, provided apprentices for, for local industry and in the, uh, the bottom left corner you will see um, the electricity generator that was in the in that hall um, that was um, rescued from scuttled German U-boats in um, in Portsmouth and brought back to Loughborough and it generated the electricity for the Loughborough College buildings in the town centre. Uh, next slide please. Uh, uh, just go back one I think Beth please. Yeah. Um, these are sort of um, images really about what we're hoping to create within the building. Um, in the four storey block, uh, there are going to be three floors of co-working space for uh, creative industries. Um, there'll be a restaurant cafe on the ground floor. Um, and the gallery uh, building, the generator hall, um, we hope will become a, a sort of multimedia gallery uh, performance exhibition uh, events venue. Um, that will be run by Charnwood Arts, which is the uh, local um, community arts organisation um, funded by Arts Council England. It's one of their national portfolio organisations. Um, and the hope is that those two parts, the, you know, the four storey bit and the more commercial uses and the um, arts use of, of the hall will work together very much as a sort of single 
enterprise. Next slide, please. Yes, in terms of, of um, how we will do it or how we are doing it at the moment, we, we formed a community interest company made up of sort of local um, concerned people, I guess, who, who you know, have been involved in various things in Loughborough over a number of years. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to identify uh, potential funders uh, with sort of mixed success uh, early on. Um, and we, we got to the stage where we, we felt we, we, we were not really succeeding in bringing in the public funds that we needed and that we would have to try and find a, a private sector partner um, to deliver the more sort of commercial aspects of the scheme. Um, and we did, we did do that. Um, and I'll, I'll perhaps in, in a bit more detail later explain how we went about selecting that private partner. Um, but we have now got that private partner on board and they provided the funds to acquire the building, um, which uh, by this time was in the ownership of, of Loughborough University. Um, the community interest company has been applying for funding and we've had a lot of help from the Architectural Heritage Fund uh, and from the National Lottery Heritage Fund to, to get to where we are. And they're currently funding our detailed design works, which is the stage that we're at at the moment. So we're, we're recruiting a design team to complete the designs for the building. Um, Charmed Arts will um, uh, apply for um, further funds um, from those two organisations and also from the Loughborough Town Deal, which sort of came into existence um, at, at a very crucial time really. And um, we hope we'll, we'll provide the, um, the bulk of the funding that we need um, Loughborough was one of the towns selected in the government's um, towns deal scheme uh, for up to £25 million worth of investment in the town. And we've been included in the, um, in the investment plan, which has just been su submitted to government. Um, our private partner will, will fund the refurbishment of the, uh, the four-storey block um, and uh, Charmwood Arts will occupy um, and run uh, the arts venue. Um, just very briefly, that diagram there uh, explained how we sort of went about it. We, we created a, um, uh, a joint venture and a single purpose vehicle uh, legal agreement with our private partner. Um, and um, that single purpose vehicle, a new company effectively, acquired the freehold of the building and has um, uh, let a, a 999 year lease to our private partner um, on the four story bit and the 999 year lease to the CIC uh, on the hall bit, uh, which we will sublet to, to Charmed Arts. So that's, that's the, uh, uh, just an outline of the scheme uh, from Loughborough and obviously happy to answer questions later on. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and now I think we've got Vicky, who I mentioned is the chair of Great Gunsby. Thank you, Vicky. Over to you. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, right. So I am the chair of the Great Gunsby Ice Factory Trust, and we started back in 2010, and we were really focusing on the ice factory itself. But um, for the past three years, we've, we've, been, we've been working in partnership with the local authority and the landowners on Grimsby Docks to bring um, the historic Dock Peninsula back to life. And you can see um, in this slide some pictures of um, buildings in the area that locally we refer to as the Casbah. Um, it developed during the 19th century to accommodate the supply chain to the Victorian um, fishing industry. And uh, when it was you know, when it was full of activity, people just called it a town within a town because it existed in a little bubble of its own on the docks. Um, nowadays, there are about 90 buildings remaining of um, probably, you know, over 200 originally. And unfortunately, there are about 70% 70, 70 unoccupied because, um, you know, 
things changed and uh, there was no there was no use for these for most of these buildings next slide please the um here are some more pictures i mean it's a very very varied um collection of um little buildings um because uh, they were just all individually built by individual entrepreneurs on little bits of land that um, the landowners um, parceled out. Um, so our current project is focusing on uh, two buildings within the Casbah. It's a 950,000 pound project. Uh, and I, I would like to say that the Architectural Heritage Fund has been extremely supportive of us right from the beginning. They um, supported us um, in producing a viability report about three years ago. And then uh, we went through the development process and the Architectural Heritage Fund and the National Lottery Heritage Fund each um, contributed 50% towards that. And most recently, the Architectural Heritage Fund has given us £300,000 towards this £950,000 project um, through the Transforming Heritage. No, can't do it, sorry. Can't remember the name of the fund. Anyway, um, next slide, please. So the first of the buildings that we are focusing on is, um, and our project is called the Petersons Project because uh, this is Peterson's Smokehouse. It's uh, a listed um, grade two, and it's one of a cluster of traditional smokehouses in Grimsby. Grimsby actually has, I think, the largest group of traditional smokehouses in the country, and that may be England, if not the UK. So um, next slide, please. When the smokehouse is brought back into use, it will be producing um, traditional Grimsby smoked fish, according to the traditional um, way of doing it, which is highly skilled. Um, these are some photographs taken by a young man <clears throat> who spent some time um, at one of the smokehouses on the docks. Um, and then next slide, please. And then you see the building with the um, pretty blue bay windows that used to be called Fred's Fish. And that is our second uh, building that we're um, going to be working on. The top two floors will be um, restored as offices and on the ground floor we are very much hoping there will be a cafe because there is no longer a cafe in that part of the docks. Um, just next slide please. Um, just as an aside, Grimsby is now the um, operations and maintenance headquarters for the North Sea wind farms which has brought um, you know, commercial activity to Grimsby Docks, a different kind of commercial activity. And uh, the proximity of the Casbah to where these big international companies have um, located themselves is um, a big advantage for us when we're trying to rent out our office space. And then the last slide. Um, just as um, another aside, a very obvious use for a lot of these buildings is for the creative industries. And I'm sure we're going to be discussing that later, but uh, it's attractive, you know, because, because the buildings are so quirky, um, it's, it, they are attractive to the creative industries and also they're cheap, uh, relatively cheap. And so um, that is our third strand. So the artisanal food, the um, proximity to the North Sea wind farms and the you know, availability for the supply chain businesses there, and then creative industries. And that's, that's the general approach towards the Casbah and the Petersons project is going to be um, an anchor project um, along with others to um, bring the whole area forward. And that's that's a summary of what we're doing. Thank you very much, Vicky. Thank you. Um, 
can I now introduce Marie? Are you there, Marie? Can you switch on and say hello? Thank you. I think you're still muted, Marie. can't hear you Marie. You should be able to unmute yourself now Marie. I think I was muted by somebody else but I won't take it personally. <laughs> Good morning everybody, I'm Marie Kirbyshaw um, and I run the Culture Trust in Luton. Uh, we're a charity, we're established in 2008 um, and we deliver museums, arts, heritage venues and activity in Luton. Uh, next slide please. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about one of the projects that we run, which is the Hat District. It's a historic cluster of old buildings that produce hats um, and were very important in the hat making industry. And they're part of a conservation area called the Plattersley Conservation Area, right in the heart of Luton. And um, you'll see that um, our high street is between the station and the centre of town um, by the um, people on this image here. Uh, we have seven, 8,000 people walking up and down the street and our project is very much about turning people in towards the heritage of the area and engaging them in, in our buildings and activities there. Our policy is around freehold. Um, it's really important that as a charity we preserve these buildings, not only the heritage of the buildings, but we preserve their use for creative industries long into the future. So we first purchased Hat House on the right, uh, the freehold, we then purchased Hat Works, which is the bottom right, which is a grade two listed building and thought to be the oldest um, former hat um, building, hat factory in Luton. We delivered a capital programme. We started three years ago um, and it's called the Hat District programme. And it was about refurbishing these buildings and turn them into new uses. We started with the Hat Factory, uh, which is an art centre, and we refurbished part of that and that opened last year. Um, we then developed Hat House, which is a creative industry workspace, um, and we're currently working on Hat Works. Next slide, please. Where did we start? Well, we started by um, putting a light onto the area. So before we got our funding, we looked at how we can create interest in the area and reposition it. So we um, commissioned a local artist, Mark Titchener, to develop this large scale public artwork and put it on the side of one of our buildings and started lighting up the area with external animation. <clears throat> this was very much about helping us make the case. Um, and akin to that, we then developed um, our funding uh, strategy and we started one of our first funders was uh, SEMLEP, the Local Economic Partnership, who gave us 3.9 million pounds to help develop it. It's very much around increased workspace and jobs. Next slide, please. So we further animated the area. Here you can see um, this was very much about creating a disruptor, an interruption to how people currently use the space. We blocked the street with events. Um, we put up um, artwork. And the one on the top right is one of our more recent commissions, which is by Jonathan Barnbrook, who um, is a designer of Bowie albums from Luton, um, who collaborated with Mark Titchener. And on there, it says, you probably can't read it, but it says the future demands your participation. So this was very much about putting words, actions uh, to the public that use the space. But it's very much about what we were trying to do ourselves. Next slide, please. And then it was about gathering views. So we uh, gathered together a group of uh, young people and people who were creative entrepreneurs who were currently working with at the Hat Factory um, and we call these uh, young people our pioneers and our pioneers have helped inform the interior spaces and how they can work uh, for creative industries. Um, and they've also worked with my team um, and other curators to look at how we can animate the space and engage people into the future. It's really important that we've, we've worked um, in dialogue to understand how these spaces can be used. So our pioneers will be the first cohort that move into Hatworks when it opens next summer. Next slide, please. 
And so how does it work? Well, um, financially, it works very much in a way that some of the buildings are full commercial rents uh, that are uh, let to companies that can afford those full commercial rents and they're still within the creative industries. And that helps subsidise some of the buildings and our activity which are not for profit. And so the whole ecology feeds itself. So it feeds itself financially, but it also feeds itself through skills and talents and interests. So um, the top left image is a company called Clearhead Media. They started up in the hat factory as a small scale incubator space, um, developed and grew. They've now got an international portfolio to the point where they can now afford full commercial rents in hat house. And therefore their rents are now uh, supporting the works of the early practitioners who are coming on stream, who need help, support, subsidies that can then come into hat works and the hat factory. And so there's movement. What we're encouraging people is to move through the ecology, to collaborate, to work together and to feed each other with skills, opportunities, as well as the financial model. And this then um, develops growth into uh, the hat district, into the creative economy, but also into Luton as well. Thank you. Next slide, please. And so this is our final part of this um, phase of the project, and we do intend to keep growing. This is Hatworks. So Hatworks is a grade two listed building. We're currently in our final phase. It's taken a great deal of time to prepare the building for the final phase, um, but we are now delivering a, a programme which is funded by um, National Lottery Heritage Fund, Historic England, and we had a grant also from the Architectural Heritage Fund of £280,000, which was critical, particularly in this year, uh, where we needed additional support to help us deliver it during COVID. Um, and also other trusts and foundations, including the Limber Trust and the Pilgrim Trust. We're hoping, we've, we've started the commissioning of this uh, final phase, and we're hoping to open next summer to our young pioneers. Um, and this is very much around our next steps. So once we've got young people, uh, young entrepreneurs collaborating, working together in these spaces, and um, then we will see how the, the energy centre and the, the initial feeding of creativity will start and feed into the ecology. So that's the final jigsaw, the final piece in the um, in the Hat District story so far. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, and and thank you all of you. Um, interesting that you've got some similarities with your projects and I think we can have some interesting questions and discussion now about about that so if we could all just put ourselves back switch on our webcams and unmute ourselves I've prepared a few questions you've actually been answering some of these questions during uh, during your presentations but um, let's let's see how we go so so my, my first one is the one of the things that's immediately striking is, as well as dealing with historic buildings, you're, you're all three of you working with industrial buildings. Now, what is it about historic buildings, the industrial buildings, that, that attracts entrepreneurs and, and the creative industry? Who'd like to tackle that one? Jonathan. I think you're going to have to unmute yourself, Jonathan. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, Vicky mentioned about how buildings like this seem to attract creatives or be, be attractive to creatives. And I think um, it's partly a sort of fashion thing, I think, that um, you know, this sort of whatever you call it, minimalist, industrial chic or whatever, it seems to be um, attractive to, to people work, to live and, and to work, actually. You think of loft apartments and stuff like that. There's something about the spaces. Uh, I think, and um, often they can be occupied um, with sort of minimum intervention, if you like, because they've already got the spaces, um, you know, that lend themselves to, to you know, modern ways of working, co-working space and cooperation uh, and the rest of it. And um, it's it's sort of possible and desirable to retain those features, you know, the spaces, um, you know, the details. Uh, in, and I think that's, that's what attracts creative industries, particularly in that sort of space. Thank you. Marie, I can see you want to come in there. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that um, it's also about the environment. So often factories require big spaces, lots of light and big windows. And, and that's also akin to a lot of creative industries that need that kind of environment. 
um, in these historic buildings. And I, I agree with Jonathan around that sort of international style. It's almost like a brand that's acknowledged, um, not just locally, but internationally, around that vernacular of historic uh, industrial buildings, that it then, it then uh, aligns with a brand. So it's part of an association, association that connects like-minded people globally by where they choose to set up their business and develop their entrepreneurial ideas. Um, but it's also, I suppose, about a connection with heritage as well. It's about that place of production and making and that's ingrained within the wood and the bricks and the metalwork of these buildings. But it's actually quite an inspiring place for creative industries to work. I think there's a number of reasons um, in which creative industries have, for many years, gravitated towards these industrial buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, we're not just talking about build industrial buildings here today, heritage buildings, we're talking about heritage high streets. <laughs> uh, and it's quite interesting that uh, none of you seem to be in traditional high streets exactly. So um, so when we think of, of traditional high streets, we think of shops. <laughs> so how will the, the non-retail uses that you're planning in your project help to create the, the high streets of the future? Yeah, go on, Jonathan again. So I kick off again. Um, I think it, it's um, whatever the use is we're talking about in time centres, and, and they are going to have to change. I think. Um, the key thing is it's still going to be about footfall, um, you know, for time centres to be successful. Um, so I think all, all the things that we're looking at um, will will bring people in. You know, it's going to they're going to be people working in our buildings, and those people will need. You know, to have a coffee and then get lunch somewhere, they'll need to do bits of shopping. Um, you know, we're, we're also doing sort of arts and creative stuff within the building, so that's very much going to help the nighttime economy. Um, but it, it, it's about getting people in um, and footfall. But it's clear that retail itself is not going to not going to be able to do that on its own anymore. Um, but I, I think the key thing is still. Marie, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just briefly, I think it's around, I think retail can still survive on a high street, um, but it's about um, selling and promoting products and services in different ways. And there's a real push for the experiential. So this is about people coming and having experience in the high street, high street that actually is a little bit more immersive. So it's about the look and the feel and the way that they can interact and communicate with each other rather than go to a high street and buy a service or a product. Um, so I, I think that we're all learning more about offering that experiential, whether it's through activities or whether it's through uh, the product offerings that are curated on the high streets to create that um, experience for our customers and for visitors. Uh, I want to bring Vicky in here, but actually there's a little message from Bev to all of us that if we're not speaking, we need to mute ourselves. Apparently there's some echoing going on. Um, Vicky, you want to come in, but I'd like you to also follow on, uh, please, to explain how you think the Casbar is actually a high street. <laughs> well, I, I was I was thinking about um, you know what, what really um, defines a high street, and I came up with a, a list um, of things. Uh, as Jonathan said, you know it's about footfall. So these places are pedestrian friendly, um, which I think you know, is not true of some um, custom, you know, purpose-built places where people go to shop. Um, and they're definitely, you know, these high streets are not purpose-built. They, they're, they're an accretion of um, different architectural styles and all the buildings have been, you know, built for a purpose and then repurposed and repurposed again. And there's a history there. So automatically, when you go to, to any high street, you are, um, as I think Marie um, indicated, you know, you, you're, you're part of history and that's an element that you're maybe not even consciously aware of, but it's, it's um, definitely a part of it. it the, a high street is open air, it's not covered. Um, it does have a wide mix of um, things that you can do there. There are always, as Jonathan said, there are always refreshments available. Um, and um, people go there with a purpose. You know, you go. You don't go to the high street necessarily just to wander about. You go because you've got a shopping list and you have to. You know, and when you 
finished being there when you go home you've crossed three or four things off your list and I think that's you know the Casbah ticks most of those boxes um, I know that recently more uh, more residential uses are being introduced into high streets but there have always been residential uses in high streets people have always lived over shops um, that's one thing that um, won't work for the Casbah because it's part of um, its, uh, you know, in, in, in the working porch. That won't work. The other thing that won't work for the Casbah is developing the nighttime economy, which can be so important. But um, in Grimsby, we've already got two high streets, and, ca and the Casbah is going to be the third. So uh, we've had to uh, concentrate on um, the unique qualities of the Casbah and its strengths and be you know be prepared not to try to compete with um, the other high streets that are already you know like everywhere else struggling a little bit i don't think i've answered your question no 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 you have vicky you've, you've it, it's an interesting d debate isn't it I and mean, we're all going to be thinking over the next months about high streets and how they're going to survive and come out the other other end and i think some of the work that we are doing with bringing in different uses and creating new kinds of high streets yeah, is, is going to be really important in the whole post-COVID recovery. Um, I mean, the work of the voluntary sector full stop is something that, that is of enormous interest to me. Um, and I'd be interested to know your kind of reflections on, on why you think the voluntary sector is taking this lead um, in taking forward the regeneration of historic buildings. Um, why are we so well placed to, to deliver regeneration in our high streets? Thanks, Marie. You'll need to unmute yourself, I think. Yes, I think that um, certainly using Luton as an example is that the buildings were not commercially viable in order to develop into other uses. And so it was essential, therefore, that an organisation like mine came along, said the building, developed a creative new use, but it's not all about that profit that um, the, the building needs to be able to uh, turn over for a commercial entity. So I think that's why a great number of not-for-profit or um, charitable organisations are looking after and taking on and finding new uses for these buildings. It's because the profit, whilst we all need to generate income, we're not driven by profit, we're, we're driven by other objectives and agendas. Vicky, okay, yeah. Sorry, yes, and I might add that um, with the Petersons Project, the National Lottery Heritage Fund has given us money through their Heritage Enterprise Program, which sucks up the um, what they call the conservation deficit. So um, to bring those two buildings back into use was never go was never going to be affordable for a developer. It had to be, um, you know, we had to go through, well, I, they would have, um, if, if a developer had come forward wanting to do that, the National Lottery Heritage Fund would have supported them, but it happened to be us. But we needed, um, whoever it was, needed to have that, um, that deficit taken care of. Thank you. Yes, Vicky, yours is a heritage enterprise project. I think Marie's probably is as well. And certainly, Jonathan, I know that yours is heritage is yours is heritage enterprise um i'm keeping one eye by the way guys on the padlet and i can see the the, the questions that are coming forward are around around funding um but i'm going to carry on with our questions first and you could just be bearing in mind that you're going to get a funding question later later on um uh, we've been talking about the the voluntary sector but but jonathan can i ask you to talk a little bit more about the relationship you've got with the private sector and how you're going to work side by side arts and and the private sector uh yes we we um we sort of got to the positions i said where we felt we needed to involve the private sector and we we, we actually went through a sort of full uh, tendering process to to select a, a, a private partner um really to satisfy loughborough university who who owned the building um that that it, it had, it had been properly market tested, if you like. Um, and um, so we went, went through a process where we, we tried to get a private sector partner to sign up to our uh, vision and structure for how it would work, if you like. Um, but, um, you know, but that, that um, 
part of the project, you know, the, the creative workshops, that, that's going to be done on a, on a commercial basis as it sounds as though it's, it's been done in, in, in Luton. Um, but we were, we were helped enormously by the University of Green to sell the building um, at a discount um, and to, to deal exclusively with our selected uh, private partner. As long as we did that through a competitive process, they, they were happy to do that. So that's made a, uh, a huge difference and effectively brought the gallery part of the building into our ownership at, at no cost. But we, we hope very much that um, the, you know, the, the operator that we're working with, they, they already run a, um, a, a co-working space for creatives in the town. And they've established a very good um, local network themselves amongst the sort of uh, you know, uh, creative um, people in, in the town. And um, there's, a, there's a, a great sort of um, spin out from Loughborough University of, uh, uh, creative people who, who want to stay locally um, and you know so part of the project and part of the justification for the project was was sort of graduate retention uh, as well but we're, we're hoping that the private sector partner will come up with um, you know interesting commercial ways of of using the gallery as well when it's not being used for sort of um, community engagement that it can be used for um, well displaying the works of of the uh, industries in in the four-story block, or um, you know commercial events, corporate events, um, you know uh, celebrations, that sort of thing, to to um, ensure that we exploit the, the full commercial potential as well as the community potential of that uh, that wonderful space. Mm. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jonathan. Yes, we're all talking about having a very diverse. Uh, portfolio, aren't we, and the different uh, revenue streams that need to come into our projects. You, you touched there, Jonathan, on the relationship you have with the university and and developing young people's careers or enabling young people to stay stay on in Loughborough. Of course, that is one of the themes of today's webinar. Um, we're being asked the question, how can the reuse of historic buildings promote entrepreneurialism and career opportunities for young, for young people? Um, Marie, you touched on this in your presentation have we anything more to add that you know, might encourage others how do you do it <laughs> yeah I, I think that you know the relationship with other partners is key um, if you look at the image that's currently on the screen um, on the right hand side um, it's very difficult to work out but you'll see that the back of the hat factory backs onto the um, University of Bedfordshire's Art and Design Department and so we've got a physical connection but we've also got an ethos connection in terms of how we want to support young people particularly those that are graduating into careers um, from, the, from the creative industries so it's very much around that sort of partnership working in partnership to uh, have fill the gaps so it's about understanding the formal education it's understanding um, career development and it's understanding how we can then ensure that the gaps are filled to let people step up from having a talent into into a creative business and of course you know in developing um, Hatworks which is our startup area if you like we've been very mindful of how we can design spaces that are going to work for a changing need um, so the need might be more digital going forward and the need might be a little bit more around scale and so having flexibility designed in is, is really important to enable collaborations um, and to develop conversations. And I suppose that's the key learning that we've had from, from our pioneers um, and from people who are wanting to uh, develop their creative industry in Luton. It's about having space to talk to and connect with like-minded others. So the clustering, the whole ethos of clustering um, is critically important so that actually you are connecting a melting pot of um, people, creativity, ideas that will then keep growing and emerging. Um, and I suppose the other thing that I would uh, contribute into this is around those shared values. I and mean, we're talking about history, we're talking about the heritage and environment from our perspective. This is about uh, a district that was there to create um, the most amazing world class hats. But it wasn't just about the hat industry, it was also about the supply chain, it was about people that made the blocks and the boxes and the ribbons and served coffees and teas to the workers and it was about the whole environment. So what we're doing is we are curating that mix and that's really, really important. So you've got the whole supply chain um, and that everybody within that 
that area has got similar values, heritage values, if you like, around you know, um, honesty, truth to material, legacy planning, creativity, and all of those things. So I think that you know, each environment, and each of the things that you know, Jonathan Dickey and I have talked about, um, the common denominator is getting the, the, the stars lining up and getting the right people together to look at how we can interpret the historic environment for today's market and for today's needs. And that does require a cluster of like-minded people to make it happen. Yeah, th thanks, Marie. I think uh, the value of partnership is we just can't project, develop any of our projects without without partnerships. And I think the voluntary sector is particularly well placed to call on its friends and you know uh, and, and work in collaboratively with others. Um, I've got a question here around how do you persuade your partners to come on board? But really, it's a question about funders. Uh, how do you persuade your fund, funders to, to support your projects? And um, I particularly want to point this one really towards Jonathan about how you've made the case for high street investment funds. You might have spotted there's somebody in the in the chat is asking about your town's fund funding particularly. And then there's another one asking about how you're going to fund the maintenance of your building in the future. So I don't know if you can wrap all of those up into one question, into one answer. But um, um, Yeah, sure. The, um... The, the Times Fund, I mean, it, it was it was partly luck uh, and timing, if you like, and partly, I think, um, uh, the fact that we'd been sort of banging on the door of, of the Borough Council about our project for, uh, for many years. Um, we, we, we did, uh, the project sort of had its origins in the Business Improvement District, um, and uh, that's, uh, you know, obviously worked very closely with the, with the Borough Council and we managed to get the project included in the Loughborough Town Centre Master Plan um, but we we struggled we were struggling to get the funding and, and to be honest the Borough Council simply didn't have the funds um, so when when the town deal came along and the prospect of 25 million for, uh, for Loughborough Town Centre that was a real game changer um, and we we spent a lot of sort of time um, promoting the project and trying to get it included in the town investment plan, um, uh, which we which we did succeed in uh, in the end. And we, we were helped, I think, by the fact that people involved in the town deal board, um, which included the business improvement district, it included Loughborough University, Loughborough College. Um, they were organisations um, who were aware of the project, if you like, and, and had always supported it, but until the town fund came along, the time deal fund came along, um, we were struggling to get any local funding into it, um, but we're hopeful now obviously that we that we will do. Um, as far as the, the, the future uh, maintenance and management of the building, I mean, that's obviously a, a very important consideration and it's something that our funders are very interested in as well. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that we'll have to do for, for the lottery fund and for the heritage fund is to uh, produce a, a, a management and maintenance plan that shows that we we can sustain the building o over the long term. So um, we, we've got to generate an income uh, to do that. Um, and you know, uh, the plan at the moment is that that would partly be by uh, the rent uh, that, that Charmed Arts will uh, will pay. Um, and uh, also, we hope from income generating opportunities from the hall. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier about you know the the events and the um, you know things like exhibitions, corporate um, events, uh, you know hospitality celebrations, that sort of thing um, that we we hope we'll be able to develop um, you know a sort of income share arrangement that will enable us to uh, to look after the building. The, the um, the, the four-story bit, the, you know, the, the bit that the commercially sponsored bit, that will have to look after itself, if you like. Can, can I just draw you out a little bit more about your relationship with the Borough Council? Um, many uh, heritage organisations have really good relationships with their conservation officers, but I suspect you're dealing with different departments of the council. Who are you? Is it yes, the regeneration the, team? You know, who is it? you Yeah, the, the, there is a. Um, a small regeneration team and it really is, it really is small um, and um, that, that's based in the in the uh, in the planning department which they, they often are if you like um, and 
we've always we've always had a good relationship um, with them and worked closely with them. We, um, the problem has been um, getting them to, to put funds in it, and it's partly because they they've struggled for funds like a lot of local authorities have. Um, but you just have to you know you have to keep sort of banging away really, and um, you know. Uh, promote your project at, at every opportunity and I'm, I'm sure they, they get fed up with us you know they uh, um, you know, we, we, we keep coming back if you like and as I say we, we were lucky that this town deal money came along when it did thank you um, I'm just also sort of conscious in the uh, in the chat we've got some questions about uh, how is the pandemic going to change things? I think this is quite important, actually, as our councils are very concer concerned about recovery coming out of the pandemic. Uh, are there any thoughts about how the workspaces we, we can create um, will be particularly appropriate in view of, of home working and flexible, more flexible working? Marie, I don't know if that's one for you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very tricky because, um, as Jonathan, Jonathan and I have both said, that um, our models require the development of creative workspace being very present within the buildings. And, of course, now with, with COVID, we're all encouraged and we have to, in many cases, work from home or different environments. And so we've had a number of conversations about, well, can the model still work? in the future with, with the new way in which we're all now working and sometimes it's more affordable to be able to work from home. And, you know, in conversations we've heard, it's all around how you collaborate and connect in the workplace. And so it's very much more important to look at those connection points of how you network, how you come together, how you meet, how you socialize, adding value to being in a workplace in a building, in a cluster. For example. So yes, I, I think there's going to be far more importance on where people can meet and talk and connect and have those very sort of casual connections. I mean, what we're all doing a lot more on is sort of digital connections through Zoom and through webinars. Um, but in a way, there's less of that casual conversation. And we know that some of the best collaborations come over a cup of coffee, tea, lunch in, in the pub. And so I, I suppose from our perspective, we need to connect in and put those places together where people can actually engage with one another. And that, I think that's going to become even more important. I think people will value it more as well, particularly being um, in isolation and not being able to connect. So yes, I think it's a, it's a work in progress. It's a watching brief. But I think what we're all learning is that there is a greater value in the sort of physical context that we have with people now. Thank you. And, and Vicky, you, you mentioned that you hope to have a cafe in, in the bottom of, of your building. That's, oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you have a cafe in the bottom of your building, and I'm guessing that's part of this need to enable, facilitate that people can get together. Well, absolutely, because I think, uh, as Marie says, you know, this is really, um, this last year has um, made everybody realise how valuable it is to interact. And um, with with the creative industries and I should I should add that um, also going on in the Casbah is an Arts Council and um, Historic England funded project for creative industries workspace and that's going to use up to six buildings um, which is um, it's now in the development um, phase so we're looking forward to that um, and yes it's going to be really important the, you know the interactions that's going to that that was that's practically the whole point um, what did you ask me? <laughs> oh, I can't hear you now. <laughs> I can't hear you. Sorry, you. I asked you about uh, having a, the value, the reason for having a cafe, and you. You. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, yes. I mean, it's it's a start. I mean, the 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 were cafes, and there are no longer cafes, and um, somebody's got to put a cafe in there, and I think I'm hoping it's going to be us, and that will be a start. Um, I'm aware that we've got almost the end of 30 minutes of questions and I haven't asked a, a critical one, um, a jargon busting one actually. Um, the, the seminar we've been asked to talk about drivers for growth. How can we demonstrate that our projects are going to create sustainable economic growth? What do we actually mean by drivers 
drivers for growth and what are the, the measurables and the indicators that we can we can put to the powers that be that, that our buildings can be drivers for growth. Vicky, yeah. Yes, well, we are going to be providing, you know, extra um, office square footage or square meterage, and that has um, that's come into the conversation often, you know, with with funders um, and with uh, with with the LEP and uh, you know and other other people that we've talked to. Um, so right, I can feel you just explain who the LEP is? What does the LEP stand for? Oh, the Local Enterprise Partnership. Thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying they've given us any money because they haven't, but um, I know Marie's LEP has um, really been helpful to, to her project. Um, yeah, so we, I feel that we're definitely um, contributing to that, not, and, and quite separately from um, the uh, graduate retention that happens through the, um, through the creative industries. Yeah. Marie, would you like to come in there? Yes, I think that um, certainly our LEP, uh, SEM LEP, South East uh, Midlands Local Economic Partnership, um, have been very supportive of us. They were the very first funder that believed in our project in a way. Um, and that's because we, um, we developed a new language which they connected with. Um, and they certainly helped us a great deal with this. So before, you know, arts and cultural charity, we talk about outputs in terms of uh, the, the people factors in terms of the benefits, the, the local social benefits, community benefits um, and skills benefits. But the new language which we started talking far more with our funding was around jobs. So it was about how can this money create new jobs, um, additionality in terms of workspace in the area, how can we be encouraged to um, um, support startups, particularly with young people? And how many skills opportunities can we provide? So, you know, our KPIs, which we report on quarterly, are all around those things, around bursaries. And, you know, it makes you feel really good as well when you know that the money that's coming in, not only is it it's supporting the care of a grade two listed building, um, uh, contributing to the sustainability of arts and culture in the centre of Luton, but it's also providing some very real needs around uh, jobs and opportunities. So certainly it's a new language, it's a great new language uh, around the local economy, um, which we're making an important contribution to in Luton, we're very proud to. Um, and I think that is part of the case and, and part of the drivers of growth. It's about uh, using a language that everybody understands, and particularly now during COVID, um, it's all around the ability to create new and enhance opportunities and new jobs. Jonathan, can I ask you, um, you Charnwood Arts are going to be your tenant, you, you say that's an arts organisation. So how, how, do, how have you made a case that they're drivers for growth? Um, it's a good question, I mean, because I mean, they, they'll, you know, they'll generate some uh, some jobs delivering what what they do, and they're, they're, at the moment they're funded by Arts Council England and by um, you know by the Borough Council. Um, but uh, they've been operating very successfully as a community arts organisation, but uh, without a home, um, you know, without a permanent home for the last thirty or forty years. And I think um, the possibility of, of them having um, you know their own home because they'll they'll have their offices in there. Uh, their own space there, but a, a venue, um, you know, they can attract people to, uh, which we hope will be quite a sort of special venue um, and create quite a unique um, experience, you know. And um, the, they've had to sort of be a bit of an itinerant organisation, you know, putting on performances or events, you know, in the town centre or around in the villages and around and about. But I think being able to, um, you know, attract uh, people and performers, as well as the community, into a, a unique venue will enable them to step up to a, a you know a much higher uh, level, and it will bring um, I think it will bring economic benefits uh, into the town as, as well as community ones. You know because if you know if, if we can get um, galleries, exhibitions, music performance, um, you know uh, whatever it might be, it'll bring people in. And it'll have that knock-on effect, you know, that we talked about earlier in terms of footfall and 
you know, using other facilities in the town centre. That, that's the hope, and that it will raise Charmed Arts to a, a new level, really, of, of, um, of activity. When, when it comes to some of these measurables, like, you know, the, the number of jobs, will it be your individual organisations that will be counting the jobs? I mean, uh, are you going to be managing these workspaces and and renting out to directly working directly to the small businesses that are going to set up in your buildings? Um, we won't, uh, um, as as the generator CIC, the um, you know all, all the sort of um, uh, letting and management of the creative workspaces will be done by our uh, by our private sector partner. But we we will have to. Um, you know, monitor that and report on it as part of the evaluation process. Um, I'm sure, um, but we're, we're not directly um, you know, managing any workspaces ourselves. Marie, yeah, we, we are managing workspace, um, and and so that's really important for us to connect in with our users now as we're developing the spaces. So that's one thing. The other thing around um, collecting data. We do that anyway. Um, however, we have contracted an external evaluator who's been with us all the way through this project, done in research, and then he he's applied a formula and a, a nationally recognised um, process whereby he can draw data that then is comparing other organisations and other projects nationally. So it's all about having a common methodology that's understood and accepted around the economic impacts. So the way that he counts jobs is perhaps different to the way we might count jobs, but in the way that he's doing it, then we can be a comparator. So I think that's probably a top tip. Get somebody who's uh, got a really good methodology that's recognised nationally to fetch your data so it can be shared and it's got real value. Yeah, Vicky. Yeah, I was. Um, I think I think our project differs slightly from the the other two projects in that uh, we're really acting as uh, property developers. We're taking on two buildings. We're going to rent them out commercially, and then um, we our business plan predicts that we're going to make a small profit, which will then be folded into further projects. I mean, it's um, but we won't be. Uh, we won't be managing the activities that go on within those buildings at all. Um, and so it's been a little bit easier for us in the case of the uh, smokehouse, for instance, we can pretty much predict exactly how many new jobs will be created um, if some, you know, if and when somebody takes that on as a business. So it's, it's almost, you know, it's quite straightforward. If, if there's a little bit of a grey area, though, if you're renting out office space, are the do the people who work there, are those new jobs or are they people who already had jobs who are, you know, coming from some somewhere else? Um, it is a bit of a grey area, but other people seem to know, as Marie says, other people seem to know how to estimate that. Yeah, yeah I mean, we're always worried about uh, displacement, aren't we, that actually we, we create space which is so attractive that we move people from somewhere else to come into our building and, and make a problem some for somebody else. Marie, I think you were coming in there. I was just going to say exactly the same. Um, just going back to the methodology, there is a way in which you measure displacement um, and it is a, a critical factor because you can't just move people around and then keep counting, double counting. So yeah, it's it's really important that, that that's um, articulated. I think there's a bit of a challenge as well for Vicky, for example, in terms of the number of jobs created. If you're creating the space for the jobs, but you, you're not responsible for employing people. Um, so you're a little bit uh, one arms, you know, behind your back, you're a bit detached there in claiming those outputs for yourself when it could be that just one person takes the whole floor, even though they could actually fit 12 people in that space. Um, and you can only count one job, not 12. Yes, um, if somebody wants to rent your space, you're not going to turn them down, are you? Absolutely not, absolutely not. Um, I think the voluntary sector is very good at being flexible, though, isn't it, in terms of who, who takes your space and, and on what terms they take your space. 
this is where the private sector perhaps is a little bit more hampered because their, their funding streams require them to have uh, firm sort of seven year leases in place. Uh, Marie, I can see you're silhouetted against the light, but your hand keeps coming up as a glowing. Oh, I wasn't expecting sunshine. Let's <laughs> um, complain fun. about the sunshine. Let's not complain about oh, sunshine. Yes. It is blinding me as much as anybody else. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it, just in terms of lost my train of thought now. <laughs> we, yeah, I was um, on to flexible leases, or I hoped you might be on to flexible leases. Yes, I think my point I wanted to just pick up on what Vicky was saying around if somebody wants to rent your space, you're not going to say no. Um, just a word of caution there. So what we're doing is we're developing a creative industry cluster where we've actually defined what those creative businesses are and should be. And I mentioned earlier around curating a district. It's really important. So um, sometimes people need to say no to somebody that might come on with a load of money, but actually they're not going to contribute to the ecology. They're not bringing the right number of jobs and they're not bringing the right level of um, you know, creative industry expertise in order to feed back into the ecology. So I think that um, anybody who is developing or thinking about developing a cluster, um, it's really good idea to define who, who is it for and how are you going to create a community of like-minded people that will then feed off itself and, and generate good conversations and healthy collaborations. So, and in that case, there might be some people that come along that you do have to say no to, even though they've got the money, they might not contribute. I think that was my point I was trying to say. Yeah, I think it's about having a, a very clear vision, isn't it? And articulating that and hoping that people will, will come, come behind it. Um, uh, now I can see some more questions coming up, or I think this is perhaps a comment from, from Anonymous about creating like-minded well, we'll give them a minute or two to type to, to finish typing typing their, their question. Um, I'm aware that we've got people in. Oh, Jonathan, you're trying to say something. Yes. You need to unmute yourself, Jonathan. Yeah, there's another comment there about community shares um, and this uh, community shares booster program. Um, which I must admit I, I haven't heard of, so that, that's something I'll certainly be following up after, after this. So thank you for whoever uh, posted that. Thank you. Uh, oh, Marie. Yeah, can I just pick up that comment that's just come in, which I think is a really important one, which says when you're creating community of like-minded dogs, um, how do you encourage diversity and avoid gentrification? Um, so many areas, it's absolutely true, so many areas do fall foul of it. Um, when I was a, a creative practitioner in Newcastle, that's exactly what happened to me. I was pushed out of an area that um, I was practicing in because the area became highly desirable and affordable. And that's happened to so many um, artists. And so I think partly it's about ensuring that the freeholds are protected so that the use can be maintained so that in an area um, such as the Hat District, we know that that area is proximity to London, you know, it's two minutes from the track, it's one of the best connected um, creative development areas in Britain in terms of connectivity. Um, we know that that area is gonna grow and develop. And so by protecting at least four of the buildings for creative uses at affordable and commercial rents, what we're able to do is to create an ecology that feeds itself and supports itself financially. And around the whole idea of encouraging diversity, absolutely, Luton's a plural town and it's really top of our agenda that we ensure that it's local people that have got opportunities that can feed into the ecology and stay. So it's so easy to lose talent to London from Luton because it is 20 minutes down the track. What we want to do is to create an opportunity um, for people to stay in Luton, stay local, and um, grow their skills locally and then uh, support others to do so too. Um, we're not doing gentrification at all. Um, that sometimes comes out of um, cultural regeneration projects, very aware of that, but um, we will keep our buildings and our functions very honest, very true and, and aligned with our, our cultural charitable values. 
I guess aligned to that, Marie, there's also the, the question um, when you create startup space, how do you keep it for startups? It presumably it means you have to push people on. Um, how are you yeah. doing that? Movement's really important. Again, we haven't launched Hatworks, which is going to be our, um, our starting area that moves people on. So you incubate, if you like, there, and then people will move on to the other spaces and places around, not just the Hat District, but around Luton. And if we don't have movement, then it becomes a stagnant uh, um, district, which we don't want. So um, what we need to do is to keep having more space, being very responsive to what people are wanting. We don't really know the exact spaces that our first cohort are going to want to move into um, as a flexible uh, responsive charity we need to develop those spaces grow those spaces work in collaboration with others to develop them and um, ideally locally in Luton and, and to the Hat District so that we can keep people within that ecology and um, so yeah you've got to keep growing um, and, and diversifying what what the workspaces are and keep movement so that that's why I showed you our object keeps moving it's got arrows that move around so that when we've got people who are established in their careers and in their businesses they're then providing opportunities and jobs for young people who are emerging into the ecology so that it just keeps moving round and round so you're going to be monitoring your startup businesses in terms of their financial viability or are you going to give them two-year leases and say that's it chaps or how are you going to define yeah. the startup it needs to move on? Or are you just going to create more startup space so you're... We've, we've got to work very organically and, and very responsively to, um, to the first cohort. So that's why we've got our pioneers working with us. We don't really fully know how it will work or the speed at which it will work. We've got KPIs in terms of we have to provide X amount of startups by um, 2023, which is part of our summit funding criteria. But um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you start them up and move them on. What we'll be doing is having conversations with our young entrepreneurs and saying, what sort of space do you need? What can you afford? We're not going to go scrutinising books. That's for banks and funders to do. We're there to provide that emotional and spatial support and network support for them. And we've got lots of spaces across the Hat Factory Arts Centre and um, in the Hat Works itself, but also in, in Hat House. And we're hoping to acquire more spaces as well so that we can move people on to a space that's appropriate for their business and their operation. Uh, are there any more questions in the chat that I've not covered, Bev? I can see the community shares one there, which Jonathan, you just mentioned on passant. I don't know if anybody else has got experience of community shares that we should bring in. Um, what about no, high school covered them. generally? What about high street funds generally then? Vicky, you're right on the edge of the Historic England Heritage Action Zone, aren't, aren't you? Are you using that as part of your project funding? Um, we will be, yes. Um, although the architectural, we were going to be using um, that funding, the, the SECA funding, as our match funding for the National Lottery Heritage Fund, but the Architectural Heritage Fund came in you know on a white charger and gave us um the three hundred thousand pounds I, I i referred to and then you know which in turn released that money back into um the, the whole project the whole has pro you know the caspar project so so that was marvelous um yeah but that that uh, it, it's available to other people coming in who want to take on a building which is great Thank you, jo Jonathan. Yes, just a, just a comment on the um, uh, uh, sort of funding sources and, and so on. Um, I think uh, Vicky mentioned that you'd have difficulty getting funding out of your LEP, um, and we we, we have similar difficulty um, locally. Um, although they have given us support, we haven't been able to get significant capital funds. Uh, from them, and we, we've always felt in Loughborough that um, we suffer from the fact that our LEP um, also includes Leicester and Nottingham, um, you know, uh, or Leicester particularly. Um, sorry, not Nottingham, um, and that we we lose out um, to the big projects in the cities. And we, we've often felt that, and uh, I have to say, I think that's one thing the government has done um, 
writer, if you like, in terms of the, of the Towns Fund. And the Towns deal is very much uh, aimed at towns um, rather than cities, if you like. And, and um, I think there's a recognition that uh, towns have lost out, you know, lots of towns in the Midlands of the North particularly, um, you know, have, have lost out of, of these funding programmes. And, you know, that maybe in, in sort of new circumstances where there seems to be you know, the possibility of a bit of a flight from the cities in terms of where people choose to live, you know, um, that they may go to, you know, uh, less crowded uh, towns, you know, where they're not so reliant on, on public transport and uh, all, all the rest of them, that may be a benefit. But, um, you know, this does seem to have been a bit of a shift in funding towards the towns, which is, which is welcome. Uh, you guys are obviously um, great precedents for, for others, and I know now people will be looking at your websites and trying to find out more about your projects. Um, do you have examples of projects that have inspired you? Are there case studies? Are there reports? Are there websites that you would be... Sorry, it's a bit unfair perhaps to ask you this at this point, but if you're, if you're um, trying to make a case for investment in your project, it's sometimes useful to be able to point to other examples. Where can people find sources of information like that? I mean, maybe I, maybe I should start. I, I'm aware of, uh, it's rather old now, I think it's uh, 2013 that the, the National Lottery Heritage Fund produced its report, its research, New Ideas for Old Buildings, um, which has got lots of statistics in, in uh, creative industries taking on historic buildings. Are there similar publications that people might look up? Jonathan? Um, well, one uh, network which we've certainly found very useful is, is the, um, the business improvement districts. Um, I know they're not, you know, not everywhere has got, got one, but, um, you know, I don't know how many there are now, there are several hundred, I think. Um, and you know, th there are, um, organisations like the Association of Town Centre Management, uh, British Bids, um, but we certainly got involved in a lot of networking. Um, as I used to work for the for the bid in in Loughborough, um, and we we got involved in a lot of networking events and uh, sessions and visits to other um, to other towns, you know, which are really useful in finding out how how people have you know dealt with with similar problems that we're dealing with you know often around ownership and funding and uh, and stuff like that so um you know um but most of those uh, bid organizations are, are really helpful i find in terms of telling you what's going on in, in other places vicky yeah i'd just like to give a shout out for htn really because uh, it it it's Whenever I've attended an event, I've always met somebody who's given me a piece of information or a tip or a hint that's been helpful. And um, I've also apparently helped other people. And it's, you know, as a network, it's fantastic. You can just, um, you can be inspired by, you can be envious, and then you can be inspired by other people's success. And, um, and, and people are very willing to share and help too, which is marvelous. I, I do recall uh, donkeys years ago being asked to review a book that had been written by a, an HTN member, which was talking about the development of their project over a 10 year period. Um, and it was written to be an inspiring guide for others. Um, in reviewing it, I did suggest that actually don't read this until you're so far stuck in that you can't get out <laughs> because it will put you off knowing that it's 10 years to get your funding together. <laughs> but um, yeah, absolutely. Shout out for HTN. Marie. Yeah, um, there's so many inspiring projects around uh, Britain, but also globally to learn from. And I'll certainly put some in, in the chat afterwards and put some links in. But there seems to be a lot of conversation today around local growth funds. Um, and it, it, some LEPs are very different from others. I, I feel very fortunate to be in an area where uh, creative industries, um, heritage and arts is a sector showcase. And so there is a focus on that. But if anybody does want to look at the SEMLEP website, it's got the local growth fund projects and they're all, it's, it's public information around how the projects are developed, their funding, 
and there are arts and heritage and cultural really good examples there. So it might be good just to see how that language is spoken, how heritage buildings are invested in through um, local growth funding by looking at their website. So I would recommend a look there if anybody's interested in working in partnership with their LEP. And I would draw attention to how important it is actually to make friends with people in the LEP, because whilst on the face of it, you look at their website and you see that it's all about major infrastructure projects and actually it's about loans rather than grants. Actually, if they get to know you and your project, they can be incredibly supportive at finding ways of, of, of providing funding for you and, and can steer your project in the direction that they can invest in. Um, so as we come up to the last sort of five minutes, um, thinking about friends, uh, a bit of a, a final question. If you could invite one influential person to be an advocate for your project, who would it be? Marie. Well, We've been after this person for years, and as I'm on a public forum now, I'm going to make a note. Um, Farrell Williams, great ambassador um, for hat wearing um, and for the design industry. He's an amazing um, entrepreneur. He's not just a musician. And we all know him for Happy and that amazing track that he did. But he's also a writer. Um, he's a fashion designer. He's the all-round creative industry success story. Um, and we want, he, he actually put the hat that he wore for the Grammy Awards in 2014, um, he put them on, um, on auction for charity. And so, you know, he's got a really strong ethic for putting back into the community. Um, and, and we want that hat. So that went out on eBay somewhere and someone bought it. I think it was about £25,000. Um, and as we've got an incredible hat collection in Luton at Wardown House Museum, and we really think that hat needs to come back into, back to Luton where it was made, um, but also tell that story about um, Carl Williams and, you know, amazing entrepreneur, great ambassador, um, not just for diversity and young people, but for being an all round creative practitioner and doing some really, really fantastic work globally. So yes, he, he would be a great ambassador for us and I welcome the conversation with him. We'll see whether he's uh, going to listen to a recording of this and <laughs> get that message somehow. <laughs> Anybody else got a, an advocate you'd like to have? Sorry, yeah. Uh, um, we, we haven't got <laughs> many local celebrities in, uh, in Loughborough. I'm having a scratch in my head to think of um, you know, famous people from, uh, from Loughborough. But, um, Locally, uh, um, I would suggest uh, the Vice Chancellor of Loughborough University, if we could um, uh, get him, because it, the, the university has been very um, useful to this project and they've been very helpful, but they've they've sort of kept their light under a bushel, really. But the um, you know the fact that they own the building, the fact that its future use is going to be um, very much you know in line with its last use is the sort of um, uh, art and design uh, college and the fact that it that it was the origins of Loughborough University and um, you know which is so important now to the town and uh, telling that that story about how Loughborough College evolved into Loughborough University um, you know if, if, if we could have a, a high profile local champion like that um, not only you know the head of one of the most successful universities in the country but also very well connected into the LEP board, the town deal board, um, you know, the, the relationships with the borough council um, and you know, various sort of uh, enterprise opportunities. So I think that's probably who we'd go for locally if we could. Vicky, have you got somebody that you would? Uh... No, I don't. I, but I think it's a great. I think it's a great idea to 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 fix on somebody and um, pursue them as Marie has done. Um, the, our most famous um, Grimsby person at the moment, I think, is Kevin Clifton from um, Strictly Come Dancing, and <laughs> and um, I'm just trying to figure out what the what, what the link would be. You know, what the connection would be. But um, it's worth. It's definitely worth thinking about. Yeah. 
Marie. I should just say Farrell Williams is not from Luton. He, he, he wore a hat that was made in Luton. <laughs> he's American, um, but he's very welcome to Luton any time. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, any final kind of remarks about making a case for heritage high streets? Any final messages you want to get back out to our audience? Well, I think I'd say, Kate, especially you know, following what you said about your book review, um, I mean, we, we've been at it for, for 10 years as well. But so I think the message is don't give up, you know, keep, keep at it. Um, and, you know, I think that's what local volunteers can bring, um, you know, because borough councils and LEPs, they move on from one thing to the other. But, you know, it's that local thing. You've just got to stick at it. Thank you. Marie? I would say have a vision, share your vision and talk to funders because actually we, we need to work together and to maximise the potential of projects. It comes with a, with a sort of patchwork quilt of funders um, who can make their own contributions in their own way. But actually sharing the vision with funders, having really honest and open conversations about how best to apply that funding um, is definitely worth doing. Vicky, the final word, I think, Vicky. Oh, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I think um, I, I agree with Jonathan, you know, stick with it. And I think that the, the community groups are the, the, the thread that ties everything together. And what happened, we've been going for 10 years also. And what happened was that we were still there and we were ready when circumstances changed, when there was a shift and there was an opportunity, then we were, we were ready. Um, so it's it's worth hanging in there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Can I draw everyone's attention to the future events in this series, funded by the Architectural Heritage Fund, Locality and Heritage Trust Network as a partnership? Bev's going to come in now and I'll do a little bit more promotion and the final. <laughs> Here we go, but thank you from me. Thank you so much, everybody. That's been absolutely fascinating i've learned so much this morning it's been great um just before i end we're only a couple of minutes over time so that went well um i just wanted to draw your attention to the events we've got coming up between now and christmas if you just go to our website click on the events tab and they're all listed there um we've got the conference coming up on the 20th of november but this will work my laptop's a little bit slow if you click on the link to it you'll find all the details of the events that are happening on that week uh, running up to the conference too so there's lots going on and really the only thing that's left to say is thank you everybody for attending um, i hope you've all found it really interesting and i hope you'll join us for the next one too so bye from us Bye. Bye. Bye.